the Canucks and the Wild, okay? Two teams going in different directions. One team started hot. One team, not so much. But right now, one team is winning some games. The other team, not so much. We got that all covered for you here on the crossover episode of Locked On Wild and Locked On Canucks. Your Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, Canucks fans and Wild fans? Thanks for joining us for the crossover episode. I'm Trevor Beggs, co-host of Locked On Canucks, and I'm joined by Seth Tupal, the host of Locked On Wild and also a credentialed media member, baby. Before we get into the episode, I got to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. On today's episode of Locked On Canucks and Locked On Wild, we're going to pick apart each other's two beloved teams, and then we're going to end the show talking about some uh, some old Wild Canucks memories and maybe ask the question, which team which uh, team would you rather cheer for as a fan? Uh, but before I do that, let me let me introduce the aforementioned Seth Tupal, the beauty himself. What's going on, buddy? How you doing? Eggsy, uh, I have been wanting to do this for a long time. And so the fact that our teams play each other twice in the next like week, perfect opportunity to do so. You guys are crushing it. I'm a huge fan of the entirety of the Lockdown Canucks experience. And so for me to be part of it today, love it. Let's do it. Yeah, let's go. And, you know, Kyle, Kyle couldn't join us, but that that's okay, man. That's okay. You know, that's that's what teammates do is uh, they they pick each other up, but one guy can't make it. And, uh, you know, the Minnesota Wilds seem to be picking each other up right now. Um, not a great start for this team, obviously. Uh, fire their coach. Like They basically were doing things that uh, we're kind of used to seeing in Vancouver, right? The slow start, the fired coach. We relate to that here on the West Coast. But uh, maybe give us the lowdown on, on why Dean Evanson got the can and whether he deserved to be fired and you know how things are now looking under new coach John Hines you know the funny thing is through the first 19 games of the season it couldn't have looked any worse and it just was everything it was defensive breakdowns bad goaltending abysmal special teams superstars not looking like they're supposed to and it led to Bill Guerin getting to the point where he's like I have to do something because anything that this coaching staff tries, they tried the tough love approach. They tried the, uh, the nurturing approach. They tried to just get the guys feeling good about themselves. None of it worked. And so Bill Guerin said, we got to make a change. And Dean Evason paid the price for it. Look, the roster, it's an older roster, not the most fleet of foot. Although we're going to talk about that in a second, because uh, you wouldn't know it these days. But it's an older roster, not the speediest roster. And so it's not necessarily Dean's fault. He just ended up paying the price for a roster that's pretty locked in and wasn't performing up to par because playoffs are the standard here in Minnesota. That's the uh, that's the barometer. And if you get off to a slow start, something's going to have to change. And the only thing that he could was bringing in John Hines. And it's 4-0 and now under the uh, John Hines experience. They've shifted from a uh, grit and physicality style to just playing quick. And a lot of the listeners are probably saying, well, how can that be? You just said that they're not a fast team. Well, John Hines has preached quickness and decision making, too, in addition to just trying to play a little faster tempo. Because if you can quickly get out of the defensive zone, push the tempo into the offensive zone, and you just hang out there, and you're just whipping shots on the goalie, you're having a great time, that's fun hockey. And so John Hines came in, a little time off after getting let go from Nashville. A little time off, he saw what was working throughout the NHL, and he said, I want to do that here. And, I mean, they just have looked like the – they they look have looked like the Bruins of last year. I hope I don't regret saying that um, through these last four games. It's been been sensational. That's a that's a heck of a quote, man. The Bruins of last year. Wild Nation is uh, is pumped up to hear that, and uh, you might have got the blood boiling for Canucks fans too. It's uh, you know those Boston Bruins, not a not a beloved team in our parts. 
were you surprised that John Hines was the guy that got the job? I was. And then I started to look into it a little bit. Obviously, they have ties to the Pittsburgh Penguins organization from the uh, the Wilkes-Barre days. And so you look at the other options there. I mean, you, you could have gone the uh, the route of Jay Woodcroft, probably. And there were a lot of fans that were saying, you know, if we're going to go with the new coach, let's try somebody that's maybe more of an up and comer, as opposed to a guy who has been cycled through a few times uh, through the coaching ranks. But Hines, he's familiar. He plays a similar system. And so I think Bill Guerin looked at this as the best opportunity to jump into a moving car and try to get it back on track without uh, catastrophic results. And so, uh, so far, it's looked really good. And honestly, I find it funny that he has just been so candid about the fact that he really hasn't done a ton. He hasn't had to because uh, the players are just playing so well so far. And so he just has come in and he's like, look, they're making it easy for me. They're just doing everything we hope that they could. And the results speak for themselves. Yeah, it's uh, interesting that you brought up that Pittsburgh connection because uh, obviously that's pretty prominent in, in uh, Canuck parts here. Um, but just for the listeners who want the lowdown, Bill Guerin was uh, the assistant general manager of the Pittsburgh Penguins before he was hired as the wild uh, general manager. Patrick Alvin, uh, after Guerin left, ended up becoming assistant general manager himself before now becoming an NHL general manager. So it's... Uh, I guess it's the battle of the Penguins cast offs on Thursday night, the battle that most people didn't expect. Uh, you know, in terms of these Minnesota Wild right now, you know, what is uh, the biggest flaw with this team? And I guess uh, for Canucks fans, what should the uh, what should, uh, opponents be most worried about when facing the Minnesota Wild? You know, I think the thing that still can be kind of figured out for this Wild team is just getting more from those top level guys. We've seen Kirill Kaprizov get closer to the guy you expected coming into the season. First 19 games were not great for him, but he has shown some real life here over these last four. Uh, the Wild have been trying to get Matt Boldy going, and he was the latest winning contestant in the John Hines Daily Double with two goals last night against the uh, the Calgary Flames. That's now three straight games in which a player has had at least two goals, so I'm going with the John Hines daily double and uh, we'll see who gets it in this uh, next game. But if they can continue to get that top level offense and just can push teams, the best teams in the league, we're going to see Boston coming up. We're going to see, you know, Dallas and Colorado again. If they can get that top six production consistently, that takes pressure off of everything else. And look, I'm not going to wish for bad results. But we've seen John Hines come in and things have gone really, really well. I'm excited to see how he handles adversity. We got a little taste of that against the Calgary Flames uh, because they made a push late. The Wild just said, all right, bet. We'll just go score and we'll just uh, we'll just take momentum right back. But there are going to be times where this team is trailing late in the game. What does John Hines do to try to uh, keep this team in it? to try to take the lead. Those are the things. That's the chess match that I'm looking forward to. Again, I love beating teams four to nothing, five to nothing. We can keep that going as long as we want, but it just is going to be fun to see kind of how he handles things when they don't go well. Yeah, it's uh, it's not going to be, uh, you know, an unbeaten streak under John Hines. This wild team is going to lose eventually, probably to the Canucks on Thursday night. Uh, you know, should I put that out there and be that cocky? I don't know. The Canucks <laughs> are just coming off of a pretty horrid defensive performance, but uh, it has been too much losing in Vancouver. So I like feeling myself. Uh, well, take that whatever way you want, man. That's a clippable clip right there. Before we get to the second segment here, we'll, we're, we'll focus uh, more on the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, I did want to ask you a bit about Judd Brackett, okay? Uh, draft guru, um, a claim, many claim he's a draft guru, at least. He's now been with the Minnesota Wild for three drafts. What's the opinion of Judd Brackett in Minnesota uh, now that he's uh, had a few drafts for the Minnesota Wild? They haven't quite finished the statue yet, but it's on it, the, it's in the works. Um, <laughs> honestly, he has had some sensational drafts with this Minnesota Wild team. And you look at his first draft, uh, coming away with the combination of Jesper Volstead and uh, Carson Lambos. I find that so funny still because, hey, guess what? Edmonton could really use a young goalie to try to fix whatever's going wrong with them. Ken Holland was like, 
nah, we're good. And so Brackett jumped up to get him, and he looks like the franchise goalie going forward while they're just continuing to sit in turmoil, pun intended. Um, so you have that. You've got this really exciting combination uh, from last year's draft of uh, Danila Yurov and uh, Liam Ugrin. That's, I think, going to be a fun combination for uh, for this franchise in the next probably two or three years. Now, this past draft, I know they uh, they took Charlie Strammel, uh with their first round pick, and they got mixed results. He's more of a physical forward type, a, a power forward type center. But then they go get Riley Height in the second round, and he is just ripping the doors off, um, just having outrageous numbers uh, so far here this season. And so it's not only the first round picks for bracket. It's some of those late round gems that he's had. He has been sensational since he took over. And I think the biggest key is that Bill Guerin has said, Hey, draft is yours. You go ahead and you go get who you think we uh, we're going to need. He just has entrusted a ton of a ton of faith in Judd bracket to handle the draft. And he has uh, more than been rewarded with that. There we go. I know it's uh, Judd Brackett was was a beloved figure here in Vancouver, uh, but looking at some of his drafts, you know, it's it started to sour a bit. I think uh, now that he's gone, you know, you look at guys like Tyler Madden, Michael DiPietro, Jack Rathbone, Colin, Jonah Gadjevich, guys that were considered um, Judd Brackett picks who, despite having a lot of potential, haven't quite worked out. But Looks like I, I, I'm hoping that he get, it makes it work for the Minnesota Wild, you know. Uh, coming up on the other side, we'll let Seth grill me about those Vancouver Canucks. Uh, before we do that, I got to let you know to uh, go check out the Lockdown Sports 24-7 channel, okay? The first 24-7 channel for sports available on YouTube. Seth's beautiful face has been on there. Maybe my beautiful face will be on there one day. I also got to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of life, but can we just talk for a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season ever in over a decade. This is scary. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if, you know, Seth or one of my friends got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from the life-saving medication they needed. Thankfully, we know we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infection, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use offer code locked on to get $20 off your first order. Welcome back to a special crossover episode of Locked On Canucks and Locked On Wilds. We thank you for making both shows your first listen each and every day. Go hit that like button, hit that subscribe button because you don't want to miss out when new episodes for either of these shows drop throughout the week. Seth Topal hanging out with Trevor Beggs. And uh, let's talk a little Canucks here. Uh, I got to know Brock Besser is just tearing it up this season. And so for all the rumors about Brock Besser trades in the uh, last couple of seasons, uh, it looks as though he has become a huge part of this team's early success. What have you seen from Besser so far that's led to him? I mean, it doesn't hurt playing the Oilers a ton, but uh, what have you seen from him to be able to get off to just such a torrid start? Yeah, Kyle and I were joking on the show about uh, the Canucks record being juiced by playing, you know, uh, with like five wins over the worst teams in the NHL, which are the Edmonton Oilers and the San Jose Sharks. Uh, you know, all jokes aside, I think, you know, Brock Besser, honestly, with the completeness of his game has definitely surprised me this season. You know, last season alongside JT Miller, the two were scoring goals, but they were porous defensively. Um, just when the, that those two forwards on the ice, the Canucks were getting scored on a lot, giving up a ton of chances. And, you know, credit to Brock Besser. He kind of had in the offseason said, you know, he wants to stay here, said he's going to change up his workout routine, his offseason routine. And, you know, you hear that stuff. And then guys come to camp. And, of course, they're in the best shape of their life. For Besser, it really seems to be true. Like, this guy was praised by talking uh, in camp for the shape he was in. And just his commitment on both ends of the puck. You know, Brock Besser's always been a smart defensive player. But I think this season, 
you know, with the system talk is put in place, Brock Baxter himself looks like he's kind of smothering puck carries a bit more uh, in the defensive zone. Um, and it helps that he's just got a swagger and his confidence back. I think in terms of the goal scoring, he's just, he's scoring a lot of his goals from in around the net. I think he's made a commitment to get to the dirty areas of the ice. He's got the smarts to uh, find openings there. But yeah, it's a bit jarring when, you know, the guy has, what, 17 goals last season. And he's already got 18 goals right now to leave the NHL. Uh, and this was a guy who, you know, this time last year, about a year ago, he was about to be a healthy scratch on a Hockey Fights cancer net. And, and, and I was at that game and I remember being very emotional. He gets back into the last second, scores, uh, almost scores the game winning goal later on. But uh, man, oh man, we come a long ways from Brock Besser's agent trying to seek a trade. And I feel like teams like the Wild could have had him for very cheap, right? And uh, yeah, it's it's kind of crazy still here in Vancouver, but obviously we're we're pretty thankful for it. If only for those uh, those troublesome uh, cap maneuverings that the Wild have had to do for uh, this year, next year, it it, it could have happened, but. Uh, hmm. Just can't do it. Um, I want to ask you about Tockett because when uh, Dean Evison was fired, I made a little bit of a comp between what Vancouver went through with Bruce Boudreaux being uh, let go. Now, obviously, that was a different situation than what happened with Dean because Boudreaux was, uh, was allowed to coach for a few games while things were happening behind the scenes. And it felt like this situation just kind of got to the, uh, the walk the plank point and that was it. But what did you see from Tockett and kind of restoring order for this team when they just were, I mean, they they were adrift. They were rudderless last year before he took over, and it didn't end up leading to a playoff spot, but it's clearly something that they've built off of this season. And you look at the standings, and they're up in that top three in the Pacific Division, and obviously they have continued to buy in what he's selling. Yeah, I, I think the circumstances around Boudreaux's firing obviously left a sour taste in a lot of people's mouth, right? One of the most respected guys in hockey. And uh, I'll, I'll tell my own personal story. I might have told it on the show before. Uh, I'm, a, I'm not a credentialed media member like you, Seth, in terms of the full-time important guy, but I'm a part-time credentialed media member, you know? And I was at that Boudreaux, uh, Boudreaux's last game. And, you know, as the part-time guy, I usually ask my questions towards the end of the scrum. But that, that Boudreaux scrum was unreal. It was, you know, about three to four times the amount of reporters and cameras in the room. Uh, Boudreaux walked in and he's like, what is this, the Stanley Cup final? <laughs> like, still cracking jokes, even though he knows his job's over. And I ended up asking like the second question of that scrum only because it was so awkward and tense that no one stepped up with the question after the first question. So I kind of just blurted out a question about, uh, you know, what it meant to play in front of the Canucks fans. But uh, again, the circumstances around that firing, uh, not so great. But at the end of the day, and I, and I said at the time, like, I believe Taco was the great guy for the job. There was skepticism because he hadn't had a lot of success as a, a successful NHL head coach. But you listen to this guy talk in interviews before he got hired, and I think he had the perfect blend between being a good systems coach but also being a good players coach. Um, and I think it's also rare that guys like Tockett, who were extremely good NHL players, are actually good coaches as well. But I think it's because he was a good 200-foot player uh, during his days as well. So the Canucks are definitely playing more structured. I mean, under Boudreaux, they're allowing some of the most high-danger chances in the league. They're both down a league average, which is a big jump. Um, and I think, yeah, he just has the team kind of playing more of a smothering style in the defensive zone, playing for each other. I think he's holding guys accountable. You know, he's benched JT Miller for a bad penalty, even though Miller's been, in my opinion, the Canucks MVP this season. So um, I think he's got this team motivated, playing the right way. Um, I think there's still some personnel issues that make me question whether they're a true contender or not. But uh I, I think it's you know very safe to say that Canucks have been a lot better than people thought they would be. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Elias Pettersson. Last one I have for you before we uh, hop in the time machine. Um, what what is the steam on on Pettersson? Obviously, I know because we've talked about it on Locked On NHL. It was before Rick Tockett took over, kind of tenuous to like, do I really want to be part of this? Um, with a long-term deal, or do I want to go somewhere else with a little bit better chance to uh, to make some noise in the postseason? But at least from my neutral eye, it looks like things are going well enough to the point that at least Pedersen is maybe not as inclined to leave as he was even as uh, as far back as last season. What, what do you think about the chances that he locks in long-term uh, to the Canucks' future? 
I think that's a great question. And I think only Elias Pettersson knows now that's a, a cop out for sure. But, <laughs> you know, this, this was the biggest question for the Canucks entering the season, right? And this season started for the Canucks with not good vibes, right? In terms of Pedersen saying he wanted to wait. Then reports came out on opening night that the Canucks wanted to also see more from Pedersen, which is crazy to think. Um, you know, obviously things have been good this season in terms of the point totals. I do think, you know, Canucks fans that watch every game know that his place dipped over the past month and he's battling some sort of injury. Um, he's still managing to be one of the best scorers in the league, which I think is a testament to how good he is. But he just hasn't looked the same for the last month. And, you know, the Canucks record has kind of slipped uh, coinciding with that as well. I wouldn't be shocked if he went more of the Austin Matthews route and signed for four or five years instead of a whole eight-year extension. That really wouldn't surprise me. In fact, I might even wager that's the more likely option right now. Um, but at the end of the day, it's there's so much parity in the NHL. I don't think Pedersen's going to jump ship and, you know, want to be somewhere else. I, I you know, by all accounts, he loves the city of Vancouver. Uh, you know, he's a quiet, shy guy. Uh, you kind of get that from interviewing him. But he's he's out and about in Vancouver and on the town, you know. Seems to really like the city by all accounts. Um, so I think if the Canucks continue winning, he's going to sign here. I think the question's more so for how long and what's that dollar amount. Yeah, the the winning, winning cures all. I really do mean it because... You know, if I'm playing Call of Duty and I go through a couple of losses in a row, you're just miserable. <laughs> like it, you lose the fun in it. I mean, good lord, during this losing streak for the Wilds, Philip Gustafson said that ice cream started to taste bad, and yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you are down bad. Like we need to fix that. And so you win a few games. Look, I mean, look at the Wilds. You win four games in a row, and everything feels like it's back. Vibes are great. Juices are flowing. Everybody's having a great time. Ice cream tastes good again. Um, and so, yeah, as as long as the uh, the Canucks continue to win, that stuff usually sorts itself out. So uh, time will tell. I, I feel like I say that way too many times on these episodes, but that, that's just the nature of the business is we'll see how it goes. That's That's all we can do at this point. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. No one's got that crystal ball. And hey, even though I said the Canucks are winning against the Wild, I, you know, no one knows what's going to happen in that game coming up. But we're going to hop in the time machine here to wrap up the show because we do know what happened previously in Wild Canucks history, specifically when these teams met in the 0-3 playoffs. Uh, before we do that, I got to let you know that as the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. Seth, let me ask you quick here because I assume you're a Minnesota Vikings fan, right? How it's, uh, what, what, how, what are you feeling for the Vikings this weekend if you're going to sprinkle a little money on FanDuel? Well, Josh Dobbs is going to be the starting quarterback. I know that for sure. And so, uh, should be some turnovers, but honestly, that, uh, that Raiders team, I think the Vikings can handle business. So if you were asking me to pick, I'd say Vikings cover. And I'm also going with the absolute chaos game for Justin Jefferson right off the bat, back off of injured reserve, whatever his prop is for, uh, for receiving yards, smash the over. I think he's good for 150 yards and two touchdowns at minimum against the Raiders. The Raiders. Yeah. That right, as yeah. Thankfully, I was playing Justin Jefferson in uh in fantasy last week. He did not play, oh. so that's a chalk one up for old Begsy. That was a, a nice W right there. Make sure you go get a W with FanDuel. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, overs, unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com/slash/lockedon and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Okay, all right, you're back for the final segment of the crossover episode, baby, here on Locked On Canucks and Locked On Wild. And, you know, doing my best, doing my best for Seth, doing my best for you listening right now, even though, you know, a couple technical glitches, okay? I'm here without Kyle. He's my backup in these situations. And you know what? Uh, a couple glitches, but we've gotten through here, Seth, and it's uh, been fun talking to you. It's also fun hopping in the time machine. And uh, for this final segment, there's kind of two things I wanted to touch on. And the first was, you know, Wild and Canucks had a, a pretty epic matchup in the 03 playoffs. Now, 20 years ago, um, you know, Seth had a beard back then, ironically enough. It's uh, you know, hard to believe, but uh, <laughs> the Canucks and Wild faced each other in the playoffs one time. The Wild ended up coming up on top. And Seth, I kind of wanted to ask you about uh, 
but your memories and where you were in life uh, when the Wild Canucks faced each other in the 03 Western Conference semifinals. You know, I uh, I cannot tell you what I was doing at that point because uh, that seems like eons ago. But I will tell you this. My hockey journey has started within the last probably three years, like legitimately. And I have learned enough about this team to know that uh, that is still the pinnacle for them. And it's ironic because you're talking about an expansion franchise that is like they're in their third season. These sorts of things, unless you're the Vegas Golden Knights, don't just happen. But the ironic and fascinating thing is if you would have at that point told Minnesota Wild fans that that is the farthest you get for 20 seasons, what do you think the reaction is from the fans? Because at that point, you're like, oh, this is great. This is just how this happens. This is how this goes every season. And we've seen now a run of seven straight first-round exits. The Wild have, I think, three postseason series wins. Um, it just It's something that they just have not been able to get to that same level. And... You look at some of those names, and it just it would have been fascinating for me to hear from fans what they think about the likes. Obviously, we knew Marion Gabrick was going to be great, ends up being until Kirill Kaprizov came around the best player in franchise history. Some of those other household names like Andrew Brunette, uh, Darby Hendrickson, you know, all these names Darby that we Kanak. look back on now and we're like, these uh these names ended up turning out pretty good. Like it just would be fascinating to talk to people and say, hey, it turns out this is uh, this is going to be the most exciting postseason run that this franchise has in their history. How do you feel about that? And there would have been people who would have said, I would trade it all for one cup, like one championship. I would trade every winning season for one cup. And especially true here in Minnesota because the list is not great. Minnesota Twins last one in 1991. Hoisted the the World Series trophy in 1991. Nothing since. And it has just been, it has turned into a minefield of playoff heartbreak, of getting up two games to one in a series and losing in just death by a thousand paper cuts. Thankfully, not having to cover the Vikings and talk about all those missed field goals or those interceptions at the Superdome when you have an opportunity to go to the Super Bowl. But Minnesota has become like playoff heartbreak capital of the world. And I don't think anybody at that point, because the World Series was still fresh enough, I don't think anybody in 03 thought we would get to this point. But here we are. And this is just why we do it as sports fans. Every year, the slate is wiped clean. It doesn't matter that you haven't gone to the championship game in like 50 years. You have a chance. That is the beauty of sports, and that is why us Minnesota fans continue to come back year in and year out because on day one, everybody has an equal opportunity. Well, except the uh, except Chicago and, uh, and San Jose. Everybody yeah. has an equal opportunity for the Cup, and that is the beauty of sports is because it can just get yanked out from under you so quickly. Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, you know, that kind of leads to my second question. I'll, I'll say quickly for Wild Canucks 03. I mean, that Wild team yanked yanked my heart out in 2003. Uh, Ten year old Begsy there, uh, cheering for Todd Bertuzzi, my favorite player. Todd Bertuzzi has his infamous chirp uh, that the Wild are gonna go golfing, and then sure enough, the Wild come back, beat the Canucks, or come from behind three one to win the series four three. That really was the end of the West Coast era. Um, I know they had some success after that, but the Petruzzi Moore incident, the lockout, that wild team really did end the West Coast Express era a bit too early. Uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on, Seth, you know, you look at the Wild and the Canucks, let's say over the past 20 years, like since the lockout, you know, the Minnesota Wild have been the more consistent team. I, I kind of looked up the NHL standings from uh, the end of that 04 05 lockout, and the Wild are the 10th best team in the NHL. In terms of point percentage, the Canucks are 16th. The Canucks have obviously had more highs and lows with going to the Cup finals. Um, but maybe, you know, if you were an, an unbiased fan walking into those situations, would you rather cheer for a team like the Wild, who've had more consistent regular season success, have generally been better to watch, or would you rather cheer for a team like the Canucks, who had those crazy highs of going to the Cup Final, almost winning it all, 
but also crazy lows of being one of the worst teams in hockey for the last five to 10 years. You see, this is, this is a fascinating question because I think just for the sake of like regular season enjoyments, it's the wild because of, you know, the, the wins that they've racked up, but just to even get a taste of what it's like to see your team play in the cup final is so tantalizing that honestly, I think I'm going to pick the Canucks and I know you trade the bad for the good. And I, I've been asked that question a million times is, would you be okay with your team being horribly bad for five years if you were able to win a Stanley Cup? And I'm like, yes, I would. Yes, I would, because you got one. And now we don't have to keep hearing about it. We don't have to talk about it every time a team gets to the playoffs of, oh, I wonder what's going to happen this time. So I would say to even have had a chance to be there just beats not getting close every single time even though you have some of those lulls and some of those low seasons like give me that every day of the week yeah i think that's a that's a great answer and i would lean canucks too i mean i think again you want you want to taste the championship and seth i know we're out of town we got to get out of here because the lockdown overlords are going to say hey you're over that half hour mark get out of here but i ask you really quickly first don't have to elaborate too much who's winning a stanley cup first between the wild canucks two teams that have never won a stanley cup Wow. Um, <laughs> give me. Uh, I I still hold out hope for uh, for my squad here. Give me. Uh, give me the wild because once they once they get once they get the money back in the account, like you you get you get the funds, you check your bank account to make sure that the check cleared, and then you're like, okay, now I can go spend it. Now I can go have a fun night on the town. Once the wilds get to that point, I think they're going to be able to uh, to really plug some holes and uh, just go full throttle. And uh, then again, it could be that the Wild never lose under John Hines. Like, I know it's a very out there possibility, but we do have to entertain the fact that this team just may never lose again. And so for that option as well, I'll say the Wild first. Yeah, let's go. And you know, I'm going with my Vancouver Canucks. The pillars are in place for this team. They just need some more depth, especially on that blue line. Uh, but I see guys like Patterson, Hughes, Miller, and Demko beating the guys that could, could carry this team, team to their first Stanley Cup. Uh, but that's for another day. For now, we got to get out of here. We appreciate each and every one of you for joining us. Shout out especially to the everydayers who tune into Locked On Wild and Locked On Canucks. Uh, before you get out of here, make sure you go check out Locked On Canucks. Locked on Canucks. Make sure you go check out Locked On at their first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories in the day with local experts of Locked On, including beauties like Seth Tupal. But for now, we got to get out of here. I'm Trevor Banks from Locked On Canucks. That guy's Seth Tupal from Locked On Wild. And we appreciate you for tuning in to the crossover episode.